Hi everyone, Spider-Man1991 here to talk about my comics for the week. Alright, first of all, books from Radical Comics. Hot Wire, Requiem for the Dead. This story is, like most of Radical's books, set in a distant future where apparently, live, where apparently spirits of the dead have come back as sort of a collection of lights known as blue light. And now, they're mostly harmless, but now they're starting to possess living corpses and they're turning into, bait, into deadly wep weapons used against the used against the world's, this world's police. And it's up to Detective Exorcist Alice Hotwire, this girl, and Detective Moby, to, this guy, to sort of stop them and get to the bottom of this and figure it out. Um, this story... I don't know. For me, I found it a little confusing because of the whole blue light situation, how they're coming back and possessing ghosts and stuff, and I had trouble sort of understanding why this was a big... why they were coming back now and stuff. I mean, granted, this story takes place during a time where citizens are sort of strike, are sort of protesting against the police because the police are starting to take over and control everything, but... Uh, this story was just a bit confusing for me. Uh, if you like, if this does sound good, sound like your kind of thing, uh, spirits coming back to use corpses as suicide bombers, uh, then go ahead and pick it up. But I really don't recommend this. I wouldn't recommend this to any of my friends. All right, now for my second and final radical book, Enchanted Legends: of The Enchanted. Uh, this is basically one of the things Rackle does with the reimagining of of certain characters. In this case, it's characters from from sort nursery rhymes and fairy tales you may have heard from your childhood, such as Red Riding Hood. Uh, this is Red Ri Red Riding Hood now on the cover. She's she also has a daughter named Verity in the story, and Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack is now a giant killing mercenary who has magic beans that give him special, that different beans give him special abilities. Uh, Hansel and Gretel, Goldilocks, Jack, Jack Nimble, Rumpelstiltskin, uh, Rapunzel. Yeah, those basically characters like that from Nursery Rhymes and Fairy Tales. They're reimagining sort of a darker setting here, where they pretty much, where pretty much now the the fairy tale characters. They all have this spell that gives them immortality and makes sure that makes sh and heals them from like any wound. But suddenly their spell is broken, and now they need to figure out what's going on. And the foe of this story is a wicked witch and her son and her son, who is the troll that lives under the bridge. Not a specific troll, just the general troll you always hear about in different fairy fairy tales. I'm pretty sure this guy spends a lot of time on the internet. <laughs> All right, and when I, Legends: The Enchanted though was pretty good. I I loved it. I couldn't put it down. It was great. A lot of action. G good story. I would highly recommend picking this up. And as my oh, and this is my last book that I, Radical sent me that I had to review. So that's it for Radical. All right, now for my now for the usual stuff I buy every week. Darkwing Duck number ten. We t again, Darkwing has teamed up with Sealbeak to stop Fowl from resurrecting Duck Thulu. Just uh, the name I just said. Just imagine Cthulhu, but with the duck. But just put the name Duck in front of it. So anyway, so anyways, we kick it off last time. Sealbeak is in injured. Darkwing's flying. Driving or well, technically flying their flying car, and Darkwing uh, from Eggheads, and Darkwing pretty much doesn't know what these buttons do, and he's hooked. And fortunately, each time he presses a button, a useful weapon comes out, and they're able to and they're able to escape the Eggheads, and they decide to go back to the foul base now that it's empty. Meanwhile, Morgana speaks to Launchpad about what's going on with Darkwing, and she tells him that she's heard rumors throughout the Mystic World that. Duckthulhu's coming back. And so, then Morgana says that they could probably expect signs in some of the most simp simple people, which they which they both come to the conclusion of the Muddlefoots. So Launchpad and Morgana go see the Muddlefoots, and, well, their theory is correct. 
Meanwhile, Honker, Honker and Goslin, who is now Quiver Duck, is going over to is breaking into foul. And of course, Honker brings up the suggestion of why Goslin doesn't have the Gizmo Duck armor, and she says that it wasn't really a good fit for her, and she th and she felt in and she's with using the whole Quiver Duck identity because she liked it from an alternate version of Darkwing. And while they and unfortunately the two. The dynamic duo here sets off a booby trap. And Darkwing is able to get Steel Beak into File Headquarters, where Steel Beak is able to use the medical equipment to heal, and he shows off some of Fowl's deadly catches to Darkwing. And then they meet meet Feme Fapil, Feme, no wait, Feme Appeal, another ex foul agent who decided to come back to sort of stop the rising of Duckthulu. So the three of them go into a cave. Find a giant and fight a giant robotic walrus, which they're having a hard time doing. Meanwhile, Goslin, Quiver Duck, and Honker dealing with dealing with more booby traps. But then they fall through a trap door and they get cornered by a number of foul agents. Okay, Darkwing Duck number ten. Again, this is a fun read. If you love the TV show, I would highly I'd still recommend getting it because it's fun, it's classic Darkwing, and it's a lot more amusing. And it's a little amusing here to sort of see each character kind of catch on to what's going on and stuff. Oh, uh, in case you were wondering how Goslin and Honker found the file headquarters, uh, Goslin mentioned that Darkwing actually drove, accidentally drove, made a wrong turn while taking trying to take Goslin to a water park. All right now for Marvel. Cyclops, one shot. Another sto another front story of one of the original X Men taking place in the early days. In this case, Cyclops. He's a teenage Cyclops, or Scott Summers, is a teenager again. Is back in his past, and he's kind of feeling down because lately he's been feeling more like the big bro. Yeah, he's been feeling more like the big brother of the group. Oh, and also the circuit, Circus of Crime breaks through. And that prompts Scott to get into action. But while at the same time, he's sort of having flashbacks of how he's been feeling like the big brother lately and not really a teenager and stuff. So Scott, so Scott suits up, goes after the Circus of Crime. Of crime. And he tries his best to hold them off, but unfortunately they get away. So he decides to follow them for the rest of the for the rest of their trip. And he follows them. And he's sort of trying to get, and he's sort of trying to get his feeling back or sense of purpose or whatever. He's well, he's just basically finds the circus, and turns out they're working for Baron Zemo. And after a few page, after a fight. Fight between Zemo, Zemo Cyclops threatens to blow up, blow up some of the equipment, which would blow up the compound, which would destroy them both. But Scott is able, to, but Scott's explanation is able to distract Zemo, distract Zemo long enough for him to knock, for Scott to knock him out. And in the end, Professor Xavier contacts Cyclops and asks him, "What's going on? What's going on? Where are you?" And Scott's just like, "Oh, you know, same old, same old." So yeah, um, my feelings about this, uh, well, it wasn't good, uh, no, it was kind of good, just not exciting, in a way, I mean, when I used to read, I mean, I did read the original, the original, the days of the X-Men back when it was the original five teenagers, and to me, back then, Scott always did kind of come off as the one who, the kid who was in charge, the one who would always tell you, tell you that that wasn't a good idea, you shouldn't be doing that, and stuff, and this story, it kind of displays Scott act, working by himself, and he's, and again, he's, at the start, he's feeling a little down, because he, because he's always so serious with the other X-Men, he's not, doesn't really feel like a kid, but this story, kind of, him being serious helped save the day, so that kind of puts him in a better mood. Uh, would I recommend this? Maybe. I mean, if you don't mind pay, paying $4, $3 for a story about Cyclops, if Cyclops is your favorite X-Men, then I'd say go for it. But 
Yeah, but not really. If you're ge if you're a general X Men fan, then I'd skip it. But if you're a Cyclops fan, then I'd recommend getting it. Secret Avengers number eleven. Uh, technically, this is a flashback issue. We the issue opens up with uh, good observe observe observing of John Steele's memories with Civil War, Wild Wild West, World War One. And being kidnapped and experimented on by aliens, and World War Two with Captain America, and Steve Rogers and the Beast are trying to figure out what what made John Steele go go rogue and turn to the Shadow Council. And Steve says that their memory that the explanations obviously last since Steele's memory of World War Two, two when he was when he teamed up with him, and one scientist points out that they could. That they have another chair, so if Steve and Steve, if Steve Rogers and John Steele are both hooked up to the machine, they could sort of compare notes of the memories and try to figure out what the hell happened. So they both enter and they both try to relive their memory, and we get the two. And these guys are amazing. They're they go they break into a fortress and they kick a, kick a whole bunch of ass. Well, not a lot, but they manage to take down a giant zombie Hulk creature. And they're going along, and apparently Steel has fought the Shadow Council before, because Shadow Council before, because he know because we see the same robe here, and apparently, and Steel says to himself that these guys are bad news; they need to stop him. And when Steve asks what's going on, all of a sudden Steve, uh, all of a sudden John, John figures out what's going on, and then shoots Captain, Amer and then shoots Captain America, and that makes Steve Rogers wake up. And oh, but unfortunately, so does John Steele. So there's a good little. Okay, Secret Avengers number eleven, pretty great. It pretty pretty awesome seeing John Steele and Captain America going in there kicking ass back in World War Two. Pretty amazing. And I do like how they kind of incorporated this helmet. How they redesigned Cap's helmet for World War Two. The World War II flashback because I think they did this because of the Captain America movie. I've seen the movie, I've seen the trailers, and Chris Evans' uh, uniform sort of consi consi consists of a helmet that doubles as a mask. So I like this. It's kind of good that they're they decided to make Captain America ditch the mask and go for a regular helmet during World War II because I mean it was a war going on. They weren't going to send him in a, send him in with a mask made of spandex or whatever all right now oh yeah this was a good one amazing spider-man 657 spidey goes to the fantastic four after johnny dies to sort of talk to them and he apologizes for missing their funeral because johnny's funeral because he's been preoccupied with uh, marla jameson's death and everything so they talk and then so he talks to the four, and they sort of share ex stories about the Spider-Man Human Torch relationship. For Ben, Ben's story is one where Spidey teamed up with them to defeat this, to defeat a being of living energy, and they end up camping to make sure make sure the being wouldn't reform after his energy was scattered. And during the whole time, Spidey and Johnny are just playing pranks on each other, fun guy, living it up. And of course, things happy because now Johnny's not messing with him since he has Spider-Man to occupy his time. And then all of a sudden, Thing thinks he sees the monster again, but it's a sp but it's a prank. And Sue's story is one where Sue and Johnny are trying to find the other three members of the Frightful Four, where Spidey shows up and pants Johnny in public. <laughs> that. And right after that, though, the Frightful Four, or Three, show up because Reed and Ben were busy battling Sandman on the other side of the city. We got Trapster, Wizard, and Beetle, who replaced Medusa. And during the battle, though, Johnny's... Spidey's little prank gives Sue, the, gives Sue an idea where she makes every other member of the Frightful Four's pants turn invisible, which... Distra which makes them embarrassed, distracts them with enough time for the Torch and Spider-Man to knock them both out. And while they're being arrested, Sue gets arrested too for indecent exposure sh since she made their pants disappear.
That was funny. Not that Vance disappearing, but that Sue got arrested for it. <laughs> and Johnny and Spidey t are able to get Bail Sue out of jail. They take her home in the fantastic car, and they kind of scold her in the same way she always scolds Johnny. <laughs> and Reed's story. Spidey, Reed, and Johnny go off in into outer space to explore, to explore the final frontier, and they notice a green star. Unfortunately, though, something goes wrong with the engine, and they need Johnny to absorb most of the energy from the star so that they don't burn up. And Reed, Reed and Spider-Man are trying to figure out what went wrong with the engine, but then Johnny tells them that apparently Johnny just makes the recommendation that it's probably the engine's probably just flooded. And they chat, and they ch the two geniuses check, and they realize, okay, Johnny's right. So they empty the engine, and boom, fly off, yay! And in the final moments of the con of this issue, Reed reveals that Johnny made one uh, that the Fantastic Four always makes hollow hollow messages in case one of them doesn't come back, and Johnny made one other message, especially for Peter. And in the end, though, Peter. Johnny comes back and he tells Peter, tells Peter that this is probably bad since everything that's been happening with his family, because he knows how Peter feels when it comes to losing family, and he says that he wants to leave Peter something so that, as his last will and testament, and he's not going to leave any any of his cars or stuff like that. But he's given. But in this message, Johnny pretty much says that he wants Peter to be on his to have his spot on the team so that Peter. Because Peter is pretty much a big part of the Fantastic Four's life, and he is a member of their family. And that's pretty much the moment how Peter joined the Fantastic Four, or Future Foundation now. This was a great issue. It was a nice tribute to the Spider-Man Human Torch friendship. It was amazing. It, and this was written by Dan Slott, so it was great. I almost cried at the end. Very good. Alright, and after that little lighthearted moment, we move on to DC with a pretty dark storyline. Uh, Detective Comics 875. We get Jim. This issue is pretty much. doesn't feature Batman. It focuses on Jim Gordon. Gordon's pretty much fo wa keeping his eyes on another, crim on another criminal. And meanwhile, and also he has a flashback with him about his son, James. Because James. James's son, who comes back to, into his life, tells his dad that he's on medication now to sort of make sure he stays in check and doesn't become a sociopath again. And the whole time, Gordon's pretty much switching. The issue pretty much switches back and forth between a flashback of what uh, to to a flashback where Jan, where Gordon thinks maybe his son killed one of Barbara's friends, and also to Jim kind of, to Commissioner Gordon catching a cr trying to catch a criminal from at the same time, and apparently as Gordon's about to catch this criminal, he reveals that he followed Gordon's family up to the lake and he sort of spoke with Gordon's son. So, but right as the revelation is about to come, Batman sw swings in and saves the day, and uh, also. And also leads to this issue. Pretty much leads to some other theories that maybe Gordon was wrong about his son. That his son wasn't a psychopath after all. He was just normal and just at the wrong place at the wrong time or something. Yeah, this was a free. This was a pretty powerful issue, though. I mean, really, for the character of Jim Gordon, this was just pretty amazing. I mean, I like Scott Snyder. Scott Snyder, who's writing this book, writing Detective Comics, he's doing a great job. This is, if you like Jim Gordon, definitely pick up this issue. Alright, now for War of the Green Lanterns, Part 3, Green Lantern and World Warriors. Guy Gardner, Arisa, and Kilowog are pretty much going back to Oa, but then Parallax attack. Arisa's possessed, Kilowog and Guy are ambushed by every other Green Lantern nearby. Kilwog pretty much shoot, gets Guy out of the crossfire so that Guy could go get help. And so Guy's only able to get in contact with Jordan and Hal Jordan, and Hal tells Guy to meet him at the greenhouse, 
which is code for this huge icy planet in the middle of no in in the middle of space. And so Guy Guy and Hal pretty much talk about about how they're obviously not taken over by Parallax because they've all been possessed by Parallax before and it's given them some sort of immunity. And then they discuss the re and then while well, at the same time Gore Guy Guy and Hal pretty much break braid each other over their secret missions. House with the New Guardians and Guy's packed with Ganthet and Atrocitus. And it's also review and well for me, at least since I have been reading Emerald Warriors, you learn that apparently the pact between Guy and Atrocitus that was how Atrocitus knew about Corona mass being behind the massacre of Sector six sixty six. And also that Ganthet promised that if they catch Corona then Atrocitus would be the one to deliver justice. Which, in Atrocitus's case, will be Corona's gonna die. So Guy, Guy and Hal are pretty much discussing what they need to do, and they both agree that they need to have, make a kamikaze attack, but then they argue over who's gonna do it, and this leads to them pretty much fighting over who's the better, lan better lantern and stuff. And during this fight, though, Hal starts to realize that that this is that they're starting to lose control, lose control of their rings, and that Corona is getting to them, and so they need to shut off their rings, and if they want to save the core, so they shut down their rings, take them off, and now it ends with them trying to figure out how they can save the core. Okay, Green Lantern and Emerald Warriors number eight. It was pretty good. Uh, both Hal and Guy have been on secret missions ones that the core do not know about and it's pretty interesting and it is good to see how these two would deal with each other in this case guys working guys pretty much working made a secret blood pact with the trostis and how's pretty much working with the trostis himself at face value or something uh, pretty interesting is how to see how these two would re react at each other's missions okay however though I would uh, one more remark, uh, get this only for the War of the Green Lanterns, though. If, or in case you're still following Emerald Warriors, then unless you don't care about War of the Green Lanterns, then skip it. But if you are following the war, then get it. Now for my final comic. Teen Titans number 93. Apparently Red Robin has joined, rejoined the Titans, which is yay! So the team goes off to goes off on a mission to see Cassie's mom to deal with the to deal with the mis missing parents of New Titan Solstice. And apparently Solstice and Ca and Cassie knew each met before in the Wonder Girl one shot that came out in January. I did not get it. So you know if if you want to know more about Solstice then I'd recommend going on eBay and finding the Wonder Girl one shot. But yeah. And interesting to note, though Raven does feel some sort of does feel the strong difference between her and Solstice, not just because her powers are light based and Raven's are shadowy based, but also because Solstice appears to be more open with her emotions, whereas Raven she can't feel anything at all. Otherwise, she lose control of her powers. And so the team basically break breaks up into groups and tries to find find Solstice's parents. And during their search, though, Red Robin reveals to Superboy that C Cassie asked him to take over as leader again. And and Robin and Superboy do find, do meet with some sort of de demon lady, and she attacks them, throws and throws Superboy through through a couple of walls. Fights Kid Flash, but blocks Kid Flash's attack. Hits Ravager with her own sword, and basically we got a fight going on here. She grabs Cassie's mother, Cassie's mother, but then, but Cassie grabs on, and she's teleported with her mother into. And now the team basically decides, wants to know what's going on, but Solstice apparently knows that that creature is a demon. And that, and now Wonder Girl and and her mother are in some sort of, I'm gonna say, different dimensional plane here. And that's it. Uh, Teen Titans number ninety-three. Not a bad introduction to Sol to introducing Solstice to the team. And as far as the um, 
setup for this arc goes. It's not that bad. We got Red Robin back, and uh, and now things seem to be working well. I mean, it's a nice setup. I look forward to the rest of this. And I'm still not so sure if what's going on with Red Robin means he's back on the team for good. But I really hope it hope that's true and that he stays on the team now. Especially since Damien left. Okay, uh, that is all I have to say about my comics of the week. So, quick recap. Teen Titans number three. Nice little introduction to Solstice here. Nice setup. If you want to know more about Solstice, then I'd say finding the Wonder Girl one-shot that came out a few months ago and reading that. Green Lantern number Warriors number eight. Get it only for the purpose of War of the Green Lanterns. Or if you just want to see a fight between two Green Lanterns, then get it. Detective Comics 876, 875. Sorry. Jim, uh, if you love Jim Gordon, get it. It's a great... It's a great story. I love it. Scott Snyder's doing a good job with this. Amazing Spider-Man 657. Absolutely get this. If you've been reading Dan Slott's run on Spider-Man, and if you saw, read The Death of Johnny Storm, then get this. It's amazing. Secret Avengers number 11. Get it if you're a fan of Captain America. If you want to see Captain America back in World War II, albeit it's brief, but still, if you want to see him back in World War II, get it. Cyclops number one, or one shot. Only get it if you're a major fan of Cyclops. That's all I have to say. Darkwing Duck number ten. Amazing. Uh, well, okay, that was a little high up, but if still, if you love this show, get this. It's funny. It's entertaining. It's ama It's great. Uh, Legends of the Enchanted. A different take on fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Get it. Hot wire. A confusing story about living and non-living in the same place with ghosts turning corpses into suicide bombers. And my comic for the week is Amazing Spider-Man 657. Love it. Nice little... The ni it's a nice send-off about that sort of details how great... how good friend, how much of good friends Spider-Man and the Human Torch were. It's amazing. And before I go, I have one more announcement. Um, I did finish my Radical book, so I'm done with that. But, well, I have been looking at a few com few comments people have made about my videos. And they've said that they're good, but I feel like I'm sort of slacking off with this. I mean, there are some other things in my personal life that are getting my attention and I think I need to focus on that in instead of this. I mean really this is just a hobby and one of the good things about hobby is you can just stop it and just not care about it. So yeah. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is Spider-Man 1 saying goodbye.